But now we have kids who start intervention when they're 18 months old. Some of those kids were at their most autistic when they were two, um, and now are dealing are in a quite a different place. So somehow we want to have criteria that acknowledges that. And all of this makes the diagnosis more complicated. So this committee got together starting about four years ago, and we decided what were, the, what were we trying to do? Now there is a huge mandate. I mean, it, obviously, it's not just ASD that has new criteria. All psychiatric disorders have new criteria. Um, and there are general mandates there. One was to focus more on dimensions, to try to identify what are the dimensions across the disorder. Um, but we felt like in our group, what did we want to accomplish? So the first thing we said was we do not want to, we're, we're not trying to cut the prevalence rate, we're not trying to narrow the scope, but what we want to do is be clearer. Because if you read what is currently DSM-4 criteria for PDD, you can meet criteria for PDD if you have poor eye contact, poor conversations, and not a lot of friends. <laughs> that includes probably at some point in our lives, 95% of us. I mean, if you took it at any given moment, and it certainly includes many, many people with all kinds of problems that are not autism. So, but I don't, I personally do not think that autism is overdiagnosed very frequently. I think when people, by the time you get a family coming to a clinician, who does a careful diagnosis, and a clinician who really looks at the child or adult um, and gets enough information, I don't think generally people just randomly talk about autism. I think they talk about it. I mean, I might say to you, or hopefully I wouldn't say it, but I saw Glee where this girl bounds in and says, I'm really rude, I can be as rude as I want because I have Asperger's syndrome. That we don't want. But that's not a diagnosis. So I don't think the committee started thinking that most people get diagnoses when they shouldn't get them. The committee was concerned, though, that how they get diagnoses is not reflected on what those criteria are in dsm 4 because all of us would have diagnoses. Another concern was to try to make the criteria more useful across age, across developmental level, across gender, and across degrees of severity. So how do you do that without having a 900-page list of what is ASD? Well, one of the constraints as of, of the APA is you get a certain number of pages. You've got to fit those criteria on one page. That is not a choice, it's just a reality. So I think our goal was to do a better job of describing what is ASD and what and then allow people to reach conclusions about what isn't ASD. And then the final thing is the reality is what we call autism or autism spectrum disorders right now, it's really just a, it's a summary that describes particular behaviors that have implications for how people will respond to treatment and how they may change over time. There are multiple biologies, as we've heard earlier, associated with autism that may, I mean, people talk about the autisms, that may pull them apart in all kinds of ways I don't think we can even imagine right now. But the reality is right now there are kids, there are two-year-olds, there are 12-year-olds, there are 37-year-old adults who need help. And we need to, and the way they're going to get help is by describing their behavior in a way where each of us could reach the same conclusion about somebody and where it has some meaning. So one of the goals of DSM, of the DSM-5 criteria is to say, look, all we're doing is trying to describe behavior here and we're going to separate biology from that in the sense that you can have autism and Rett syndrome. Or you could have Rett syndrome and not have autism. You could have autism and fragile X, or autism and 16P1113. You know, but you can also have those genetic conditions and not have autism. So you're not just lumped all together. You, there gives you an opportunity as we learn about genetic conditions or as we recognize associations with GI problems, those are coded separately. And it means that 
But right now, somebody who has fragile X has fragile X. They don't have autism, they have fragile X. But what we're seeing is some people do have autism, some people don't, and just trying to be a bit more humble about the fact that we're talking about criteria. So I'm gonna do this really fast or you'll never get lunch, you guys. But, so the first proposal that I'm sure most of you have heard is the idea of instead of having these subcategories like PDD, NOS, Asperger, Childhood Disorder Disorder, Fragile X, Rett Syndrome, there's one broad category which is Autism Spectrum Disorder. It is not associated with a particular etiology in, in terms of that criteria, but it can be associated with a particular etiology for a particular child and you just code that separately. The most controversial part of this, I think, is Asperger syndrome. And I think there are a number of reasons why the committee felt like there should not be a separate subcategory of, of Asperger syndrome in, the, um, in a scientifically based set of criteria. One is this, there is no scientific validity for Asperger syndrome. There are a lot of very useful aspects of that term, but when people compare we know what is often called high functioning autism to people with Asperger syndrome and control for verbal IQ, you get no differences unless you've defined Asperger in some kind of unusual way. So if I define Asperger as meaning people with poor motor skills who have high verbal IQs and lower performance IQs and I compare them to another sample, that's what I'm going to get. But there, nobody has been able to find those consistent differences. A second issue is concern with services. In some states, you do not get services if you have an Asperger syndrome diagnosis. And we have the odd situation where kids are moving. A little, a very small kid gets a PDD NOS diagnosis because the clinician's unsure. They then get an autism diagnosis because they start a school and the best school for them serves autism. They get better, they get verbal, somebody starts calling them Asperger's. Then they have a hard time maybe, um, and need services as an adult and suddenly they're back to autism. I mean, in the recent CDC report, I think they said over 20% of the kids before age eight had had multiple diagnoses, different diagnoses within the spectrum. And this is very confusing and can be heartbreaking for families. I'm gonna quickly show you data from the, uh, one particular study that was done through the Simon Simplex of 2,200 kids who all had ASD. We're seeing in 12 different sites, and the reality is that the distribution of the different autistic behaviors in these kids across sites was almost identical. That is, every site saw some kids with very severe repetitive behaviors and a few kids with none. But when we looked at how sites made clinical diagnoses of autism, Asperger's, and PDD-NOS, it was totally different. We had one site that called every single child autism. We had another site that called most kids PDD-NOS, some autism, some Asperger's, and everything in between. And these are, they're not all the same kids, but the distribution of these characteristics was identical across the sites. The point here is when you look at how different clinics across the country and Canada made diagnoses, each one of these columns are the factors they used, each place within themselves had their own definition of Asperger, PDD, NOS, and autism. So people were very consistent and when someone says, I know what Asperger's is, they do know it's just the trouble is they don't, what they're talking about is not the same thing as what you're talking about or you're talking about. 